Okay, so we are looking at the DSM today. So just a couple of the biggies, if you're only taking the, if you're taking the clinical one, bipolar one and bipolar two are always on there and having to know the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two. In general, lay people, people who are not in our profession, really only know of bipolar one. Bipolar two, you wouldn't be aware of unless you really kind of were in the profession. Okay, so then bipolar one, I'm going to know that because it has at least five full days of mania. And mania means like off the wall, can't sleep, um, you know, buying things I can't afford, sleeping people that I don't know, just like the highest high ever. Five full days. However, I do have to still meet the criteria for depression. I have to have at least two weeks of depression. And that's the, that's the criteria for basic depression. You know. And then I have to have, again, two full weeks of that and then one week of that full-blown manic attack. My bipolar 2 is only going to have then four days, four days of less. And you'll see the higher my highs, the lower the lows. Okay, so then um, when you're really way up there and having that good old time, you know you're going to crash. So um, Shameless, which is a show that, you know, is awful and you probably shouldn't watch. However, on Shameless, there's a really good episode of what it looks like. Oh, I see Rochelle joined us with her baby. Uh, um, the episode Shameless has a really good um, a, a portrayal of what it looks like. It really does. Uh, the mom in the scene, it shows that it's it's genetic. The son actually gets it. It's a whole seasonal thing on, on um, um, Showtime or HBO, one of those things. Um, and the mother, you know, she has, she's married and she gets divorced and she marries women and does this and she's really kind of out of control. And when she does come in the picture, there's one scene where she's going to redecorate the kitchen and she's got the sledgehammer and she's like, you know, putting holes in the walls and making all these, 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 you know, big changes. And that lasts for like five days. She buys money, she buys the kids stuff and then she can't get out of bed. Okay. So very typical of what that would look like in a full bipolar one. Okay. My medication of choice for that one is going to be my lithium. Remember that lithium that's in those lithium batteries? That is exactly the same lithium. So if we're using that, the problem with that is then um, it really causes a toxicity. You're putting lithium in your system. So then my um, that's the one medication that does require that you get um, blood work. So in the beginning, it's usually about once a month, but then it goes out to every nine days. That's the one medication that is going to require some blood work. I had one question about the bipolar one. I read somewhere if you've had just one manic episode and you didn't have to have depression with it, but so you have to have both with bipolar one. So you can be diagnosed with just a manic episode. And then your bipolar one. No, no. If you don't have the down, you you can just have a manic episode. And it's not a hypo; it's a full blown. You can, yeah, you can. You sure can, and not and not meet the criteria. So I doubt that would be on the test, but that is, that is one of our diagnostic issues. You sure can. You sure can. Okay, um, and then, you know, especially, you know, we're going to rule out that it's not drug or, or medication related, but yeah, you can have that full bone episode. That can happen. Okay. Okay, that is definitely can happen. Okay, so cyclothymia, two years of those ups and downs. If you see that, you know, it's that's the darker purple, it is, it's not the full blown like ups like everybody else has. I always, I used to call it baby bipolar and then my students would say babies get bipolar. So it's not a baby bipolar, um, but it is a, a two years of kind of not having the same swings that everybody else does. If you look at the green, that's kind of how everybody else is. So, you know, we have like life goes on and, you know, some things happen like, oh, my gosh, COVID hits and I'm really depressed. Uh, you know, my husband leaves me. Uh, I lose my job. I'm depressed. But, you know, I bounce back up from that. People with the bipolar have a severe reaction to all of those. With, I'm sorry, with cyclothymia. So their reaction is always going to be more severe than the average Joe. Okay. So five full days, then I'm going to look for, in mean, my bipolar two, I'm going to look at having um, 
uh, four days or less, both of those have to also meet the criteria for depression. Um, and I'm going to treat that with medication, which is going to be my lithium. Okay. So bipolar 2 is treated with lithium also? As well, it sure is. It sure is. If lithium is not on the list, um, it's going to be then a Depakote or a Tegretol. Those are my anti-seizure medications. Epicote, Integritol. Okay. So what we know is in general, some people um, really can't handle that. Yes, two weeks of depression for bipolar 2 as well. That has to have a diagnosis. So most often you're going to see a question that, you know, little Becky Sue comes into the office um, and, and she says she can't get out of bed and she's very sad and she's going through her stuff. And then we put on antidepressants, right? We put on some Prozac, an SSRI, some um, Paxil, one of those. And then like three weeks later, two weeks later, her mood elevates. She's like, she's on top of the world. It's like, oh my gosh, what happened here? Her mood is elevated. So then we have to take her off the antidepressant because we're, you know, feeding her with extra serotonin that her body doesn't need. And that episode will last for five full days or, or less than four days. That's how we diagnose the bipolar. Okay. The five days, the five full days, um, sometimes those end up in hospitalization. So that might give us the diagnosis as well, um, but many times it, it, it comes off as a depression first. So yes. Okay. And that is then, that is what it looks like. That is my uh, bipolar 2. And the, on the test though, unless it asks you that it is, it, if it's bipolar 2 or it clearly states or looking that you, to know that you know that, assume that it's bipolar 1. Medication of choice, if from bipolar 1 or 2, even cyclothymia, is still going to be lithium. Lithium does require blood work. And if lithium is not one of the choices on the test, then you're going to look at the others. Atagritol, uh, Depakote, uh, Lamictal, any of those anti-seizure medications. Okay. One of the other big ones that comes across is the difference between the schizophrenias. Okay, so what I know is my brief psychotic disorder, okay, that is going to last from three days to three months. I'm sorry, excuse me, wow, three days to 30 days. That is my brief psychotic disorder. After 30 days, it's going to turn into schizophrenia form, which is a form of schizophrenia. Okay. Then it's going to be schizophrenia, full-blown schizophrenia, after 60 days. What we know is that, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Three days to 30 days is brief psychotic disorder. 30 days to six months, one month to six months is schizophrenia form, a form of schizophrenia. Okay. Then after six months, it has to be full-blown schizophrenia. So it has to be at least six months. So you're going to see the question, how long it's been happening. When you're going back to those questions, and I always say go back to the question and prove it, you're looking for the proof of how long it lasts. Okay? With schizophrenia, I'm going to treat it with a, a, any of those, any of those, brief psychotic um, schizophrenia form or schizophrenia, I'm going to treat that with an antipsychotic. That's going to be a Tegretol, uh, Respirator, a Respiridol, um, Haldol, any of those. And of course, I do know that those then bring on that face thing, right? What's that face thing called, Linda? Tardive dyskinesia. It is. And then truly, it's not only in the face. It is in other parts of the body. Um, you, can have your, you can have spasms in your arms and things like that. I've seen one patient... A while ago, he could barely speak, and his hands were moving and everything. They sent him out mm -hmm. to the hospital from the institution he was in, and I don't know what they gave him, but he came back a different person. I've never okay. seen it, ever. So this one is just a side effect of the, of the you know, 
the the this antipsychotic. So right, you might, use them resveratrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that one of those, then you might just say that he um, um, the 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 cure for that is to stop taking the medication because it's it's a central nervous system disorder. It is not a muscle disorder. So I've seen that question. Is it a muscular disorder? It is not. It's a central nervous system. It is the way the medication affects your brain. Okay. It is not permanent. It does go away with stop taking the med stopping the medication. The other one is cogentin. Cogentin, and I put it in the chat box. That is then the one of the uh, medications you would take to counteract the side effects of schizophrenia. Okay. With schizophrenia, I'm going to then also have, I'm looking for all of those, brief psychotic, schizophreniform, and schizophrenia. I'm looking for hallucinations and delusions. Okay. And remember, I can help my, my hallucinations. I'm going to have, I'm experiencing with all five of my senses. So I always ask my clients when I was in practice, are the voices coming from inside your head or outside your head? Delusions are thoughts in your head. If you're new with me, I have several delusions. I do have erotomania because I believe Barack Obama is in love with me. I, I'm pretty sure it's true, um, but people around me say it's not. So that, is, that delusion is called erotomania. Okay. Um, again, so those are that's the belief that someone famous is in love with you. Okay, so those are my types of delusions. Okay, those belong in the category of schizophrenia. So in order to have schizophrenia, you're going to have either or or both. So you're going to have the delusions, those thoughts, and then you're going to have the, um, um, the, the voices, things outside my head. Okay, so my, my erotomania is when someone famous is in love with you. I think you're like David Letterman years ago. He had someone like break in his house because she was so sure you know, that he was in love with her, blah, blah, blah. Um, grandiosity, um, you know, that over and sense of, of, of inflated ego. It's not like the personality disorder. It is like um, someone, you know, walking down the street thinking they are like the, the king of the world. Um, you have to bow down to me. Okay. Um, in, in one of the Disney movies, the, the characters come back to current daytime um, and he comes back and he was a king in the, in the Disney store and he comes back to, you know, he's in New York and he's a king and he's like, what do you mean you're not my servant? So it really is you believe that you are the king, the God, the whatever. And again, the thoughts in your head tell you that. Um, the jealous one, um, I've seen that question where like the husband thinks his wife is sleeping with like the milkman, the, you know, the um, post office man, the, the barber, the butcher, everybody. So he's got some delusions of jealousy. Uh, persecutory, people are coming to get you. And then somatoform, soma means body. So anything that's somatic has to do with my body. So anything, uh, a somatoform disorder is when my um, body so it means body, manifest the physical, the, the emotional stuff that's going on in my head. So all of those things belong to my delusional disorder. Okay. There's one more on that list that's not on there. Um, idea of reference. The idea of reference is actually one of the most popular ones. Um, that is where there's some truth in things that happen and people take it out of context. Uh, again, so for example, um, I'll let you know, you know, again, you know, um, Mr. Brock's in love with me, right? When he was on TV today and the other day and he was doing like, you know, the uh, tribute to John Lewis. So every time he like <clears throat> cleared his throat, that was the key that telling me that, you know, he was going to meet me someplace. That's an idea of reference. Okay. So the reference is it did happen, right? Yeah, it happened. Okay. However, what I do know is that probably didn't mean to me, but an idea of reference is based in some truth. Those are all parts of delusions. And then my hallucinations, again, like I said before, those are those things that I, that I, all five of my senses. Okay. So my hallucinations, I can visual, I see things no one else sees. 
olfactory. I smell things. Um, you know, I, my, my skin is rotting. I can smell the, the decompensation. I can smell, you know, all this stuff. You know, people, that's, that's their hallucination because it's something they can smell. It's a senses. Okay. Gustatory, that's a taste. I, you're poisoning me. She's poisoning my food. I can taste it in there. I can taste the poison. I can taste the poison. Okay. Auditory, of course, we hear things that no one else hears or sees. And tactile, there's things crawling on me. Okay. So that's my tactile hallucinations. Again, all five of those, any of my senses, all five of my senses can experience some delusions. So for full-blown schizophrenia, I'm going to have both solution, hallucinations and the um delusions at least for six months for that full-blown diagnosis. Okay. okay, so we're going to just go over some questions today, and as I ask the questions, it'll kind of give you an idea, uh, again, of what we're, what the questions, the questions might look like. I do appreciate if you chime in, please, or answer. Please don't make me share, all, don't talk, make me, don't make me talk the entire time all by my little lonesome. Okay. So number four, look at that one. A social worker is seeing a client who complains constantly of smells that aggravate him. Recently, he said that he cannot sleep because of the smell of fungus in his home. His work has been affected because the fungus smell in his office makes it impossible for him to do his job. He had his home inspected and no fungus has been found. His employer refuses to have the workplace fumigated. He can no longer date his girlfriend because of the smell of fungus. What is the client experiencing? At A, B, C, or D. I got a C. I got an A. A C. Okay. So, olfact, hyper olfactory senses disorder sounds great. However, that would not be a DSM diagnosis. If someone's got some issues with that, that wouldn't be something under our medical, under you know, our umbrella. Um, the olfactory hallucination is the correct one. Okay. And remember somatization disorders, those are, there's a list of those. Somatization disorders are when my body is going to act, um, act out or experience some of the things, some emotional things. Okay, so malingering and fictitious disorder are probably the ones that you've heard the most about. Remember, my malingering is when I, um, malingering is what? Anybody? Oh, it's when you're, um, you're faking it to get okay. something. To get something. That's the key. Exactly. <laughs> malingering is when I'm faking something to get. There's some gain in it for me. Okay. So for example, Munchausen by proxy is a malingering disorder because I'm trying to get out of it. So by proxy means that I am, I've made my child sick. I've made somebody else sick. So I'm trying to get out of workman's comp. I'm trying to, you know, not work. I'm trying to get something out of it. So that is malingering. So when you see those questions, I'm trying to get something out of it. You know, um, not that bigger. Probably not get any bigger. Okay. So um, again, so Munchausen by proxy is when you make someone else sick, so that you, they get you get the attention. Okay. So all of my somatoform disorders, they have gone to a medical doctor first, okay? They got to you because the medical doctor has ruled out there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing physically wrong with them, so they've ended up with you, okay? So that is my malingering. Now, my other one is my fictitious disorder, right? My fictitious disorder is truly faking it, right? I don't really know why they're faking it, okay? Um, we believe with like fictitious disorder that perhaps there's um, um, primary and secondary gains. My primary gains are, you know, something that you can't see. My primary gains, of course, are on the inside. I like the way it feels when I see the doctor. I like getting the attention. The secondary gains are things that you see. Um, you know, my family comes to visit more often. I'm getting um, something out of it that you can see. Those are the secondary gains of like a, fati a factitious disorder. Okay. Um, and the other one is then my conversion disorder. 
What's that one? A conversion disorder really is the one that is a central nervous system. It really is um, blind, blind rage. Yes, you got it. Exactly. Okay, so my conversion disorder is I have seen something traumatic, I've experienced something traumatic, and then I, um, what happens is then I have a bodily, a bodily um, response to that. Okay, um, for some reason, we still don't know why, but the conver um, common conversion disorders are more common in poor rural areas. Um, I don't think we know why that is, that's just one of those facts. So blindness, deafness, um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, um, paralysis, tremors, anesthesia, all of those things. Um, it says it can happen at any age, um, but something has happened. When you're looking for on the test, something has happened. Um, the husband left, a hurricane hit, some trauma. Okay, um, my, I was uh, molested by my by somebody. In in the book. Um, I know why the cage bird sings. Okay, um, she talks about not saying anything um, and not being able to speak. Okay, and she was she was um, um, raped by a relative, and when she told the family about the person that happened, the other relatives went um, to get him and they killed him. Okay, and then at that point she said she couldn't speak. So something traumatic happened, and then that disorder happens. It is really not a physical disorder. There's nothing wrong with her, but it is some poor, something happens in our, our cognitive system. It's a central nervous system disorder that um, you cannot, you have had that now blindness, um, inability to walk, talk, etc. That's a conversion disorder. So fictitious, malingering, all of those are my conversion disorders. Okay. So the answer to four was um, C. That's an olfactory hallucination. Okay. Let's look at number seven. So that is that is a first question. Okay. So it's a first question that has to do with the DSM. So remember that a first question. I'm always, 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 always going to assess. Remember, um, I don't, I'm not a fan of the acronyms, so I always look at the, the way we're taught, that social worker problem solving method. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, make sure there's no issues. Safety is always first. Then if the question is high in feelings or very, very upset, I have to acknowledge feelings. Third, I'm going to assess. I'm going to assess, 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 gather as much information as I can. So this one is a first question. My bells go ding, 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 ding. How can I gather as much information as I can? You'll find there are very, very few intervention questions, very few intervention answers. Most of it is about gathering the information. So look at number seven. Bingo, Miss Jasmine, bingo. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do is find out more information. Okay, he comes to me and he's upset. Is he upset because he liked the girl and she's, you know, now he's schizophrenic? I don't know why he's upset. I'm going to ask him. Okay, A says explain to the client what schizophrenia means. He didn't ask me that. That's assuming he's upset because he doesn't um, know what disorder he has. Don't worry in the question, do I see that? Let the client see his chart. Does it, do I know that's the problem? So those are A, B, and D are at the intervention set, uh, uh, intervention phase already. I can't intervene yet. I don't know enough to make that intervention. Okay. Okay. Let's look at number nine. This woman's having a good old time. Husband accuses her of having an affairs with the pastor of the church, the next door neighbor, the local grocer, and the daughter's boyfriend. All of which are untrue.
That's correct. It is my paranoid personality disorder. Remember, my personality disorders are egocentric, right? Personality disorders, people are not coming for treatment. They don't see a problem. So when you see these terms on the test, egocentonic and egodystonic are only related to diagnostic questions. So don't let it trick you and they'll say, oh, it's egocentonic with the family or things like that. It's only a term where you, that you're going to, we're going to use with diagnosing someone. So remember, personality disorders are always egocentonic, okay? People um, are, are fine with the, the, what's going on. They're not coming for treatment because they're okay with it. Okay. So my ego, okay, that's a Freudian term, of course, but my ego is like, you know, who I am, my personality. So personality disorders, they've been ingrained since that person was little. Okay. We don't diagnose to 18, but if you ask the mother, oh my gosh, he's been that way since he was little. He's always stacked up his shoes. He's always done those things. That's what lets me know that it's, it's a personality disorder because it's who they are. So, syntonic, in sync with who I am. Dystonic, I don't like this. You know, D-Y-S, I don't like this. So then, all the personality disorders are egocentonic. The way to work with a personality disorder, medication does not help because it's their personality. So the goal is to make the egocentonic, then egodystonic, or you might see the word ego alien foreign to their ego. Okay, remember, so back in the day, those were my access to diagnosis because we really couldn't identify those until we'd known the person for half a minute. So that is a, those personality disorders, so ego syntonic. The other disorder is, of course, my anorexia. My anorexics always think they're fat, so that also is ego syntonic. They're not coming to you because they're too fat. But they don't have a problem. Someone brings them to you because there's a problem with that. So that is ego syntonic and sync with who they are, all personality disorders. Ego dystonic is all the other disorders except for anorexia. And the cure, the right to do those is then to make it, of course, ego alien or a foreign to their ego. And the best example of this, of course, is looking at OCD versus OCDP. So my my um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Migraine is the disorder. That's the, di the you know, level one diagnosis. The PD is the personality disorder. The main difference, uh, and we can see it now clearly with COVID, my OCD people, that's an anxiety disorder. Okay. So the more things are out of control in the world, the people with OCD feel like the more they, they, they need to control them. So those um, symptoms wax and wane. They get worse, they get better. Um, my daughter um, has had some has had some anxiety issues, and and part of like when she feels like life is under control, then her OCD gets worse. Um, she has to shower, you know, three times a day, but only seven minute showers. Okay, has to wash her hands, but only in the time frame. Things have to be made up in an order. She has to make her bed, and that's only when the crisis is going on. However, when the crisis is not going on, then she's bad. She's not in the same place. The personality disorder, the green, they'll say the same. Okay, they've always been that way. The mother will say, oh my gosh, when he was two, he was so cute. He was stacking up his shoes in order when he was two. Because things needed to be in order for him. Okay, but again, personality disorder, because it's been going on for a long time, and we're not seeing any waxing or waning, it stays the same. Okay, again. The personality disorder is um, not easily recognized because they, you've known them their whole life. They've always been that way. The OCD with the blue, the disorder, easily recognized because, again, those, those symptoms are going to change. Obsessions are my thoughts. Compulsions are the act. So my obsessions are in my head. Oh my gosh, I've got to wash my hands. My hands are dirty. There are bugs crawling on my hands. I've got to take care of them. Those are my thoughts. The compulsions are the actions. So the person with the blue that has the actual disorder, you're going to see those raw red hands, like yucky. Oh my gosh, they like, like they hurt the touch because their obsessions, especially again, as COVID goes up, okay, they're going to find uh, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Hold on, Rosa, I'll answer that, okay?
my OCPD, the personality disorder people, um, they are then going to, it's not going to get any worse. COVID has no effect on them. Oh, the green people, personality disorder, life has to just be perfect. The question will say, you know, um, which, per, which, which um, diagnosis um, is it that a person doesn't mind, that the person has to, often gets in trouble because they turn their work in late. That's the, the personality disorder. It has to be perfect. They'll turn it in late because it has to be perfect. I, I'm old enough to be back in the day when we did like, you know, handwriting, pencil and paper stuff. So if you're old enough to remember, you'd had someone sitting beside you that would do all their work and then they would like just rip it up and start over. That's a personality disorder. It has to be perfect. OCD people, the reason for their stuff, the green, is they believe that something awful will happen if they don't follow their routine. If I don't do this, this, and this, and this, and the world will cry, come crashing to an end. If I don't turn the oven off, you know, turn the knob seven times, then something awful will happen. The house will burn down. They have to stick by their routine. Okay. Again, the blue people, that is ego dystonic. They don't like it. They're going to come for help. They don't like always feeling anxious. They don't, always, they don't like always having to have those com, you know, constant thoughts in their head. They're really uncomfortable with that. The green people, personality disorder, who they are, but that way their whole life, they're good with that. Okay? So OCD and OCPD. Um, it, is, it is a defense mechanism. It is not one of Freud's defense mechanisms. It is not. Um, so defense mechanisms are unconscious choices. Um, so Freud would not use that as one of his, okay, what I'm going to say is for the test, that would not be correct. No, nope, personality disorders are not. They are not. Nope. Okay. They're ingrained in who you are. Okay. And I'm not going to say that forever, Rosa. I will just tell you for the test, that would not be one of the defense mechanisms we would test on, even at the LCSW level. Okay. Remember when you're studying the test, you're looking at the, what they want to know is, do you know the basics? They're not going to give you something that's way out there that you have to figure out. They just, they just aren't. Okay. So we're just kind of looking at the basics. Okay. So let's go back to my questions then. Oh, okay. Pam, I have a quick question. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Just to clarify, so I know that OC, OCPD, I know that is ego syntonic, but OCD, mm -hmm. that's o ego dystonic, right? Correct. People okay. don't like it. They come for treatment. Right. They don't like it. So are the, are the ego dystonic, um, is that all the other diagnosis or what? Besides personality disorders? And anorexia. And anorexia, okay. Yeah. Most okay. other people, they, they don't like it. Like, I don't like feeling depressed. I don't like the anxiety. Right. I don't like any of those things. So I'm, gonna, I'm more likely to come for treatment. There's no guarantee they're going to come, but I'm more likely to come because I don't like it. Correct. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh -huh, no problem. So medication of choice, Jasmine, since you're on, what medication would I use to treat OCD? Uh, you would use anxiety, so like that, um, Valium, Xanax, Boost Bar. Ah, but those are addictive. My benzodiazepines, I would be addicted to them. That's true. Um, <laughs> okay, so the question said, what medication do I use every day if I'm, uh, it, what, what would be okay to use every day for anxiety disorder? What would you tell me? Was Zoloft, that right? Yes, <laughs> Zoloft. Zoloft, yeah. Yes, that's what you're saying, right? That you're going to tell me? Yes, Zoloft. I, I knew it. Yes, <laughs> Zoloft. <laughs> so those are Zoloft is in the category of SSRIs, selective right. serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay, um, those are the newest classification of antidepressants. My body doesn't know the difference between anxiety and depression, um, so. Yes, benzodiazepines, especially, they're great. They're good with panic attacks, panic disorder. However, they are addictive. Okay, you know, that's why they're sold on the street. You know, you can buy a bar because they're extremely addictive. However, for, so a doctor would only prescribe, um, a, a, for, the, for the test, the question might say, um, 
what medication would you take on a daily basis for anxiety? And that would be the Zoloft. It's also could, used for depression. Could it be uh, Prozac also? It could be, but what we know is that Zoloft is the medication of choice for anxiety. Okay. But they, they operate the same way in your system. Um, and I, I don't know what the chemical dependence is or what, what of the chemical makeup of Zoloft, what makes it different. Um, but Zoloft is the answer for that one. If you're looking at panic disorders, you can use a, pen, a benzodiazepan and you can use them as a PRN. So that's, you know, like Jasmine said, your, your Valium, your Xanax, all of those things. Um, in order to have a diagnosis of a panic disorder, you have to have at least one panic attack and the next, yes, clonopin also. Thank you, Rosa. Yeah, absolutely right, clonopin. Um, in order to have a panic disorder diagnosis, you have to have one panic disorder within 30 days. And then the rest of the 30 days, you're worried that you'll have another one. And that's a panic attack. And that gives you that panic disorder diagnosis. So then you really might be prescribed then the benzos. Okay, because they're fast acting. It gets it into your system and it's going to stop that panic attack. Okay, so panic disorder is one panic attack within 30 days, but the rest of 30 days, you don't have to have another one. You're just worried that you'll have another one. If you've ever had a panic attack, you think you are dying. Um, you know, we spend millions of dollars of people who've gone to the emergency room because, you know, they, they're not, they fuck they're dying. And, and you really do. Your, your heart is like pounding out of your chest and, you're, and, and you have tachycardia. Your heart rate is up. It's real. However, there's no organic cause. They'll run all the blood work, all the test work. There's nothing going on. Um, so then that's when we just diagnose it as a panic attack. Okay. Let's look at number 10. Okay. So we're going to rule out C, a, a panic, dis, a generalized anxiety disorder. In general, my generalized anxiety disorder um, is a free floating anxiety. I can't pinpoint it on anything. It's an always feeling of anxiousness, not being able to sleep, not being able to rest. And ongoing, and that, of course, I would give you that. I would give you my um, Xanax. Okay, okay. So, social anxiety disorder. Prove that to me in the question. What words support that? Because um, in the question, it says that she's anxious in social social situations. Um, she thinks that she'll be ridiculed um, because of her shyness. Um, oh, that's a key. Ridiculed, ridiculed. Yeah. Ah, that's avoidant personality. That's a thank you, Renee. Uh, that's my avoidant personality disorder. Uh, my avoidants really, really like people, but they're terrified you're going to make fun of them. My schizoids are loving COVID. They will stay away. They love COVID. They don't ever want to see you again. They're great. Okay. However, my, in that question, and again, you're always going back to the question to prove the answer, okay? okay. And, and, okay, and you probably didn't, but you have, that's, that's the key is what is the question asking me? So even if you think you know the answer, go back to the question and reread it again. Prove it to me with the words in that question, okay? My schizoids, of course, they are loving COVID. They're the ones who could care less. Oh my gosh, no one's come for six months. They're good. They're the, that's the house you don't go to visit on, on Halloween if you have kids. Like, we are not going to his house. He only comes out for the mail. He doesn't smile and he goes back in the house. Okay. And he's not bothered by that. He's fine. 
My schizotypals, they're the ones who are typically more schizophrenic. However, they do not meet the diagnosis for schizophrenia. They haven't had any hallucinations or delusions or any of those things. Okay. So my schizoids are like, stay away. He doesn't even want the fish to talk to him. And my schizoids, they're the ones who dress weird, act weird, um, all those good things. Remember, when it comes to schizophrenia, there are positive and negatives of schizophrenia. The positives are the things that they should have, the things that they, don't, they shouldn't have, hallucinations, delusions, things like that. Schizophrenics are also extremely disorganized. That's why they're not dangerous. They couldn't remember where to put the bullet and the gun at the same time. They're, they're just, you know, all they have is in that shopping cart sometimes. So the schizotypals are more like the schizophrenias. Um, okay, interpersonal awkwardness, social isolation, flat affect, okay, like hello, no one's home, okay, so those are schizotypicals, but avoidant people, they really, really like people, they want to hang out with you, um, they're just very afraid that you will judge them, so if we go back to the question, that's what we know is because they stated She's excessively sensitive to criticism from her siblings. She misinterprets comments from a friend. All of those things make it avoidant personality disorder. Okay. Um, let's see. She comes to the practice to address her anxiety issues. Anxious in social situations. Yes, I see that part, which would make it social anxiety disorder. However, let's read the rest of the questions. Afraid of being ridiculed. Got a history of that. Remember, personality disorders are ingrained. It's happened in childhood. We're just seeing it. We don't diagnose it until they're 18, but this is not a new issue. Okay. Let's look at 11. I see an A. Jacqueline, were you married to one of those people? <laughs> those narcissists? <laughs> My narcissists are full of themselves. They love themselves. Okay. On the outside. But if you see a question about which personality disorder has low self-esteem, that's going to be my histrionics. I'm sorry, that's going to be my narcissist. They really do come with this great you know, outward appearance. However, on the inside, they often worry about things and they feel like they, they do have low self-esteem. For the test, my narcissists are going to be a man and my histrionics are going to be a female. That is not true in the real world, but for the test, that's the right answer. Okay. So my histrionics... Here's someone's dog barking. Get yourself. My histrionics are my drama queen. There we go. Okay. I will tell you. So if you do if, look at your girlfriend group, if you do not know the histrionic in your girlfriend group, it's probably you. Attention, attention, attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me. No, they're not promiscuous like my borderlines. They really are not. Um, flirtatious, um, seductive, but not necessarily um, like sleeping around. Um, she's wearing the high heels. She's got the big flower in her head, the short skirt. Hello, hello, hello. Look at me, world. Okay. A question might be that, you know, um, the client, that, that your client is very upset that her boss won't even accept her Facebook request. She's my drama queen. She's the one that you go out to dinner and she's like, oh my God, I gotta send this back. I can't believe this happened. Okay, so um, that's my histrionic for the test. So the tension-seeking people are, are gonna, histrionic are gonna be female. 
my narcissists are going to be men. When you walk into a party and you are like, oh my gosh, I'm here, I've arrived. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm histrionic. My narcissists are like, you are lucky to be breathing my same air. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So for the test in the real world, that's not true, but for the test, when you're looking at those answers, those options, histrionics love the attention and are female. My narcissists do not. My narcissists also have low self-esteem. Okay. Look at 36. This is a borderline. Whatever you pick to go back to the question and what words in the question support your answer. What words that you see? This is a typical question. You have to take your knowledge of a borderline, black and white. They love you, love you, love you, hate you, hate you, hate you. They've seen a thousand probably different people. So understand the text of the context of what's happening and understand the what a borderline looks like and then find the words in the question that support that A. Okay, let's go back to the question, okay? I'm going to tell you the answer is D. The answer is D, okay? Got it. The answer is D. So, um, I, I'm at a presentation. My assumption is always, you know, if I'm presentation, maybe I'm in the middle of a, the, I'm at the hotel or I'm a conference center and I'm giving a presentation on personality disorder. And, and people come up to you all the time afterwards of your presentation. They want to ask your opinion. They want to blah, 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 do all of those things. Do I know her well enough to, to um, diagnose her? No, I just met her. I just met her. So the problem with A, if the attendee has a concern, she should check with her doctor. The question tells me she's already seen a doctor. It says she was previously diagnosed by a psychiatrist and she wants me to confirm her diagnosis. Okay. So, She's already seen her doctor, so that makes A out. If you're diagnosed with cancer and you want another opinion, what do you do? You're going to go to another oncologist. Okay, so if her psychiatrist she saw gave her this, her, this, this diagnosis and she doesn't agree, then go to a different psychiatrist. So the answer is D. Okay. I don't know her well enough. She's borderline. Borderline people are very unstable. Love you, love you, love you. Hate you, hate you, hate you. A, I, you know, if, if the option was, um, you know, um, a scheduled appointment on Monday, 
So B says meet with the individual after the conference to discuss her concerns. No, I'm doing, I'm at a conference. No. And I do know that she, borderline people, um, have had several different diagnoses, probably several different people. You'll get a borderline. If you, if you've spent like, you know, a couple of sessions with a client and you think you're crazy, they're borderline. They will come in. Oh my gosh, you're the best therapist ever. I've never seen anyone like you. I've had 17 before you and you are the best. Oh my gosh. And the minute you say something they don't agree with, they're out of there. Okay. That's why we use DBT, that di that um, dialectic behavior treatment. Okay. Because that teaches, that's where those terms, um, um, mindfulness, those came from that because of our issues with the bipolar disorder. I'm sorry, with the um, borderline disorder. It's used now with children also. But mindfulness, emotional regulation, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness. Okay, so that's that dialectic behavior therapy, DBT, that was designed just for my bipolar disorder. Uh, sorry, my borderline disorders. Okay. Borderlines have difficulty maintaining a relationship, whether it's a, a spouse or even a therapist. Um, they can't stand anything that's uncomfortable, so they run. Okay, so that's what that looks like. So this is DBT. And again, you might see that on either one of the exams, the master's or the clinical level. But this is it was designed to treat the borderline personality disorder. All black or all white. Love you, love you, love you. Hate you, hate you, hate you. Uh, yeah. They want things their way. Exactly. And they, and they cannot stand if things don't go their way. So in a relationship, whether it's a personal relationship or with a therapeutic relationship, you know, if they show up 15 minutes late and you tell them you can't see them, then they're gone. They don't have that emotional regulation to say, oh, you know, maybe I was wrong. It really is. Okay, they're out of there. Remember personality disorders, there's no medication. What we, what we do is we treat them um, with the goal is to make those issues ego dystonic or ego alien, uncomfortable with their ego. Going through guys, just looking at some DSM questions when it comes to diagnosis. Remember those not questions. So those are hard for most people. So I, for me, I try to figure out which three might be correct and which one would not be correct. She's 60, um, hospitalized with delusional disorder. Remember, those were the thoughts in her head. Um, she's convinced that her neighbor is uh, able to access her thoughts through the telephone lines. That's some paranoia, right? That paranoid delusion. Okay, which would you not take? A, empathize how vulnerable she feels. Yes, of course. She, she really believes this is what's happening. B, acknowledging how difficult it must be to be hospitalized. Um, yeah, okay. Acknowledge how the illusions feel real to her. And then D, confront her on the unreasonableness. I'm not going to do that. There's When someone's in delusion or having a schizophrenic or any kind of, you know, um, uh, in their psychotic episode, there's no convincing them. That's their reality. So there's no convincing them that this is not the case. This is not going to happen. Ah, let's look at number 94.
I got to see. Go back into the question and make sure you can find the words that support that. The answer is, oh, overeating disorder or binge eating? Oh, my goodness. So the DSM is going to be a binge eating disorder. Okay. If she were throwing up, it would be bulimia. My bulimics are normal weight. You would not know the difference. Okay. My bulimics will eat and eat and eat and then throw it back up. But this doesn't say anything about her throwing it back up. That's a binge eating disorder. Okay. Do you guys know what rumination disorder is? Yes. Please share. Uh, basically, it's a disorder where you um, you eat something and then you, um, I want to say you throw it up. And then you swallow it, I believe. Yes, it's so gross. If you YouTube it, you can see it. It's so gross. Thank you, Jasmine. You <laughs> chew and chew and chew. And either you swallow and then pull it back up from your throat or you put it in your hand and then put it back in. So it is, it's a psych, it's a medic, it's a, um, uh, psychiatric disorder. There's nothing wrong with your swallowing things, but it's really, really gross. And you are correct. That is exactly what it looks like. That's my rumination disorder. And of course, pika is one of anything that is not the food. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Look at 95. Got it. You got it. You got it. It is the loss of the previous skills. So, um, when when um, a uh, when autism disorder and now it's called, of course, the autism spectrum disorder, when it first came out, um, parents would always say that their children had the speech and they lost it, or they had the abilities and they lost it. So now we have been able to differential diagnose that yes, there's some kids on the spectrum. Who, who may have had, who have a, disinte a disintegrative disorder, that they could walk, they could talk, they could do these things, but they've lost it. But that's different than autism. Children with autism never really had those, those abilities. Um, now we know to kind of, you know, look what to look for. Um, but in the beginning, when it first came out, um, we, we just didn't know. Okay, good, 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 good. 96, so the answer is D on 95. 96? Look at you, Michelle. That is reactive attachment disorder. That is. Remember, that is based on Margaret Mailer's object relations theory. And what she said is that, you know, if children do not have that, that person to bond with, then they really will have difficulty many times in their life. So that reactive attachment disorder, um, if you don't bond with those first few years, you're going to have some difficulty. We do believe that there is a... Um, a relationship between reactive attachment disorder and conduct disorder. So remember my conduct disorders, those are the kids that are diagnosed by the age of six um, and have, um, uh, it has to be diagnosed by the age of 13. They are the ones who are my, my punching, you know, uh, 
killing animals, putting dogs' eyes out, or, you know, throwing rocks at ducks. I mean, just cruel things and not having any remorse whatsoever. My conduct disorders, untreated, end up many times being my antisocials. So antisocials are not people that don't like, you know, people. They love people. They will invite you over to kill you and eat you and blame you on top of that. So in our field, we use, we don't use the term sociopath. We use antisocial. Antisocial are people who, who really have no regard for society, no regard for those rules. So there is research that really suggests that reactive attachment disorder untreated will give me conduct disorder. Conduct disorder untreated that ends up at age 18, day, by 18, diagnosing you with a antisocial personality disorder. My ODD kids, what's the difference? How are they different than the conduct kids? I think ODD kids are just um, defiant, mm -hmm. um, but they're not killing in animals okay. or trying to hurt people. They're just not oh, listening God. to adults. <laughs> you got it. And when, in the questions I'm going to look for, good, Jasmine, very good. You get my bell. In the questions, what I'm going to look for is um, making sure that my, have they broken the law? Okay. Argue with authority figure would definitely be an ODD kid. Okay. They're going to argue with you because they don't think they can stand up to you. They don't, they can think they don't challenge your authority often. My conduct disorder kids, they have no regard for your feelings. None whatsoever. Um, you know, in a classroom, uh, a teacher you know, says something, the ODD kid will get mad and he'll throw a table. He sure will. The conduct disorder kid is going to throw the table aiming to hurt the teacher. And clearly you're going to see their intent. Their intent is to hurt someone. They're lawbreakers. Whether it's truancy or shoplifting, any of those things, that's what you're going to look for in the question because those conduct kids are my lawbreakers. Okay, this has nothing to do with DSM, but I like to touch on these sometimes. Look at 103. This is a policy question when it comes to those indirect questions of social work, um, you know, that people always hate. Oh my gosh, I can't do those. Summative. Summative means it's at the end. It's the summary. What words suggest that? The program will have an evaluation component that assesses the program from the planning stage through the implementation stage. Oh, are we stumped? I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so I'm going to go over the terms. A summative program, sum means a summary. It is at the end. So a program has happened. Someone wants to replica replicate it. It's going to be my summary. My formative is in the middle of the process. I am still forming the goals. I'm still working on the program. Um, that's formative. So those are program evaluations, either summative or formative. Okay. Cost benefit and cost effectiveness. Those are both money terms. When we're looking at the, the money spent in a program. So we have two choices. Cost effectiveness is, um, and I use the I use the the situation that's going on right now. So we've got this COVID thing going on, right? So the CDC um, is our government agency. The United States government has poured money into CDC, the CDC, to come up with a vaccine. They're not looking to make money. The vaccine from the CDC, a government nonprofit agency, is just trying to make sure we find an effective cure. That's cost effectiveness. So the money we pulled into the CDC, you know, we will know if it's successful if we come up with the vaccine. 
cost effective. Cost benefit is then more of my private sector. So what we know is those big pharmacy companies, big pharma, you know, Merck and all those people, of course, they're racing to find a vaccine as well. However, people privately have invested money in those big companies because they know that once a vaccine is found, they'll make money off of it. That is cost benefit. I'm going to invest in your company, but I expect to make money. Most of my hospitals are cost benefit. I'm going to put in, I'm going to hire the top surgeon and I put all this money into the top equipment. But the bottom line is we better make some money. That is cost benefit, money for money. So you are correct. The answer is C. That is a formative program because it's gone from the planning stage to the implementation stage. Back to the question. Does it say it's over? Nope. So there's no formative, I mean, no summative. I'm not summing, summarizing or ending anything because it's still going on. Okay. So summative, formative, sum at the end, formative what's still going on. Cost benefit, money for money. Cost effectiveness is um, how much money did I spend and how effective was it? If you're using APGAR, those are probably in chapters either eight or nine, depending on what chapter, what book you have, but those are in there, okay? And I strongly suggest that you read those. Those are those ind indirect questions. Um, so those, uh, before we get to community, that's how you run an agency. And, you know, many times the test, can, the questions can be up to 50% of that indirect questions, those indirect services. Let's look at 108. Again, we'll go back to my DSM. I got a B. That is correct. Body disforming disorder. So that is what we believe Michael Jackson had. Okay. Correct. That is B. Body disforming disorder. Okay, so those are the people that look in the mirror um, and they, you know, they see a, a, something a gross. There's, they don't ever like their picture, all of those things. Okay, yeah. Good, good, good. Ooh, 109. Look at that one. Personality disorder, personality disorder. Remember, psychoanalytic is something unconscious. I think the answer to this one is C, but I don't know how it would work. Very good, because people of antisocial disorder, my conduct disorder kids, they don't get that their behaviors hurt other people. They really don't. They, they have no clue that other people could be affected by their choices or their behaviors. So that's what it is. It's not focused on their emotions, but focus on the fact that you are hurting other people. Okay. With our conduct disorder kids, the key to them is, is teaching them empathy. You can't hurt an animal because it hurts the animal. Okay. So exactly. So C is the answer.
Remember, with any personality disorder, I'm trying to take it from ego dystonic, ego syntonic, and sync with their ego to make it ego dystonic. So it's uncomfortable for them. Medication is not the choice. Antisocials do not need more assertive training. Again, they're the ones who are going to kill you. Those are my sociopaths. But I do want them to understand the consequences of their actions. They're hurting other people. Okay? Psychoanalysis, that's a Freudian term. I'm going looking for something unconscious, some, you know, um, things that happened in their childhood, things like that. Those are words I would look for. Okay? So, treatment focused on their emotions because the goal is to make it ego alien, foreign to their ego. They don't, they don't get it. Okay. Okay, guys, I think that's the last one. Let me look at this one. Oh, let's do one more there. 120. Gad? What words in the question? Let me think it's Gad. How do I know if it's A or C? What in the question supports? What words am I looking for? That's called the stem. So what words in the stem let me know that it is A or D? I'm sorry, A or C. I didn't mean A or D. A or C. Thank you. A or C. So it's not a phobia. I don't, there's nothing in there she's specifically afraid of. So is it generalized anxiety disorder or is it a panic disorder? So go back to the questions. What in the questions support that answer? That's what I'm looking for. What words? It says she has um, the pounding heart, dizziness, mm -hmm. um, chest pain. That would be to me, I think it's panic disorder because with generalized anxiety disorder, it's just almost like obsessing and worrying about everything. Yes. Yes. That is a panic. Exactly. Those are the keys there. Chest pain, nausea, pounding heart. I mentioned earlier, when you have a panic attack, you, you are sure you're dying. You get tachycardia. Your, your heart is racing. You're sure you're dying, okay? Generalized anxiety disorder is that I can't sleep. I'm, I'm, over, I'm always, always a feeling on edge, okay? So those symptoms, the panic disorder, I'm sorry, the chest pains, the nausea, the pounding heart. In order for it to be diagnosed, it only has to be 30 days, okay? It's been on for six months, okay? So that makes it a panic disorder. So then, what medication would I use for panic disorder? Probably be a clonopin or one of the one of the benzos. Exactly, I would, I would, I would. Okay, because what I know is that panic disorders um, most often you can you can feel them coming, you can feel that happening. So if you're on one of the benzos, you take it PRN as needed, not every day, to decrease those panic disorders. You got it. Gad Shaniqua Gad doesn't have a. Um, it's a free-floating anxiety. It's not tied to anything. It's like always feeling anxious. Um, I wake up in the morning and I feel restless. I, I don't sleep well. So, God, I can't pinpoint to anything. It's, it's just always out there. 
okay? But this one, the, the clear issues were the chest pain, the nausea, the pounding heart. So all of the questions, whether it's these kind of questions or it's, you know, just the vignettes, go back to the question. Look for the words in the question. The answers are in the question. I'm sure that you've heard that from other tutors, other programs. Go back to the question and prove it. Okay. I'm always going to get down to two. There are two that make really good sense. So this one, it was either GAD or panic disorder. I had to go back to the question and prove it. Okay. All I see in those words, I don't see enough to support my, my generalized anxiety disorder, but I do see enough to support my panic disorder. Okay. That is the key to this test, guys. Is it's, 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 um, I'm, I don't want to say it's hard. Um, it is, it is, you have to know the information. Yes, content is important, but you have to know what they want you to know. On these DSM questions, they want to know, do you know the DSM? Do you know what these diagnoses look like? Do you know just between GAD and panic disorder? Do you know enuresis? Do you know bipolar 1, bipolar 2? That's what they're looking for. And they're giving you the, the answers. I promise you, in the STEM, that's the, the question here, the answers are in the STEM. Go back and prove it. That keeps you from bringing anything outside, any prior knowledge, anything that you think well, you might have heard. All you need to go is go by these, these five lines. That's all you have. Based on those five lines, what do you know and how can you answer that question? Okay. When you take the test, really step out of yourself. Forget everything that you do in the real world. In, for the test, you're living in a utopia. There's enough, there's resources and there's money and all those good things are just right there at your fingertips. We know that's not true in the real world, but in order to pass this test, you have to think like you have just graduated, that you have never worked in this field and you know what you're doing. Okay. Okay, dokie guys, it has been a pleasure. I do have to go. Um, I will see you next Sunday or sometime this week if you have an individual session scheduled with me. Um, I will remind you always, thank you for choosing me. I, I, I appreciate Let me stop, stop saying that so you can see my face. Okay. Somewhere. Stop sharing. Stop.